All right. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Ida, for organizing my visit here. Thank you for inviting me. It's uh, it's awesome being here. Um, and um, so today, uh, my talk is going to be on towards trustworthy deep learning for regulatory genomics and beyond. And so um, I'll give you a little bit biological motivations. So biological systems are challenging to study because they rely on higher high order dependencies. Take, for instance, this cartoon diagram of a promoter enhancer complex for gene expression. Now, there are many proteins here shown in a different color, and they're interacting with both the DNA as well as with each other. So if we want to build an accurate mechanistic model for this biological system, then we need to know who all the players are, where they bind, how strongly they bind to DNA and with each other. Of course, different genes use different promoter sequences, which use a different distribution of transcription factors. So coming up with some kind of analytical solution for this general system is incredibly challenging. Problems like this exemplify why deep learning is such an attractive approach, because the deep learning uh, model is a powerful function approximator that can autonomously learn what the... That can autonomously... Don't touch. <laughs> yeah, that can autonomously learn. A deep learning model is a powerful function approximator that can autonomously learn features, and and so in principle, it can be trained on just the DNA sequences, and they can learn the binding sites of each of these proteins, their location, their binding strengths, and high order dependencies. Now, you know, indeed, deep learning is showing great promise to revolutionize data analysis for genomics and precision medicine. And the area that I'm interested in is on understanding the functional impact of mutations in the non-coding region of the genome. This is where gene regulatory elements primarily reside. So the basic approach taken by me and many others in this area is to train a deep learning model to take DNA sequences as input and have it predict a regulatory function, such as TF binding, uh, chromatin accessibility, or even gene expression. Now, if we trust that our models are making accurate predictions based on, you know, a real underlying biology, then we can employ it to help us to uh, understand the functional consequences of mutations. So the way we do this is we now send in sequences with a mutation and see how the model's prediction of these regulatory function uh, changes. And this can help us to prioritize disease-associated variants for follow-up experimental validation. Now, uh, deep learning is quickly becoming a very commonplace analysis in genomics. Uh, a simple literature search with deep learning and genomics shows that the number of papers is, is rising quite rapidly. And, um, but despite its popularity, um, the uh, critical you know, issue remains. We, don't really under, we, don't, we still don't fully understand why the models are making their predictions. So in biology, we wanna understand what our models are learning. This is why we tend to gravitate towards simpler mechanistic, interpretable mechanistic models. But in the regime of big, noisy, and high dimensional biological sequence data, it's not always clear what the signals are and how they vary. So it could, so it could be very challenging to devise a mechanistic model that provides state-of-the-art predictions. When it comes down to it, you can't deny the impressive performance of deep learning in so many uh, applications in biology, healthcare, and beyond. So there seems to be this uh, trade-off between an easy to interpret mechanistic model that provides weaker predictions and a difficult to interpret deep learning model that provides better predictions. Now, uh, my, my, lab's, uh, my, my, my lab's research uh, aims to bridge these two approaches. And my philosophy is that we should embrace the powerful function approximation capabilities of deep learning to learn the relevant features uh, and signals in these high dimensional biological sequence data sets then we can interrogate what our models have learned to gain insights into the underlying biology. And this can also uh, help us to in turn uh, develop more robust and accurate mechanistic models uh, afterwards. <clears throat> now, despite its rise in popularity, there are still many, uh, there's still this question that remains, are we there yet? And um, I can tell you right now, emphatically, no, um, but, while these class of models are, are still making a lot of noise uh, and they're very powerful, there are so many technical limitations. For instance, uh, we, we tend to train our models on data from a snapshot in time, though biology is dynamic. And second, uh, we, uh, our models are, are fundamentally just learning associations and it doesn't have any idea about any causality. And, and But these two uh, issues are actually broader issues that extends beyond just biology, more on just general computational modeling. But we don't really have the right kinds of data sets to address these issues, at least at the scales of regulatory genomics that we aim to model with uh, deep learning. 
So uh, today I'm going to focus on uh, some other limitations that uh, but my lab has made progress towards is evaluating models uh, and, and how interpretability methods are often misused, misunderstood, or misinterpreted, and uh, the, the fact that our model predictions are still fragile. <clears throat> So just to highlight the basic problem again, um, the, we have a deep learning model that takes as input one hot encoded DNA sequences, and it predicts a regulatory function. And this can be uh, framed either as a binary classification uh, representing zeros or ones, or a quantitative regression, where the model's predictions are trying to predict uh, the read counts from these high throughput assays. And, and so binary classifications are just a summary statistic of that redistribution, uh, either as zero non-functional non or one functional. And, and the vast majority of, of models, uh, of deep learning models in this space has really been in this binary classification space. And the quantitative regression space is a more recent and emerging trend. Now, it, it's currently the wild, wild west of deep learning models in regulatory genomics. I showed you that the number of papers is, is rising quite rapidly. And in each one, everyone has their own neural network model with their own architectures, their own tricks, and their own data processing and so forth. It's really complicated to know what are the actual innovations, the building blocks that are generalizable uh, that we can use in the next generation of you know, neural network systems in this space. So um, it, it's really challenging because we haven't been able to really evaluate these models, especially the binary classification models and the quantitative regression models, which are newer. So uh, Shush and Amber, two talented grad students in my lab, have systematically analyzed hundreds of deep learning models across all of, uh, so many different modeling choices. And um, uh, although that's being cut out, uh, th their paper was recently accepted. And so, but we do have a free bioarchive version out right now, uh, it, it, and, and we updated it recently. But the, importantly, they didn't just look at the model's prediction performance. They also looked at how well the model's uh, variant effect predictions are uh, and how well uh, the model's predictions are to uh, robustness tests. And uh, also what insights we can gain from interpretability analysis. Now, just to give you one slice of their you know, exhaustive study, um, I'll, I'll just give you a little, quick little background. Here, they trained a whole bunch of neural network models to take in 2KB of DNA sequences and predict 15 attack seek profiles uh, uh, fit, uh, across 15 cell lines. Uh, and uh, we trained, our trained a whole bunch of different models, binary and quantitative regressions, and we evaluated their uh, prediction performance on a held out chromosome. And that's represented by this Pearson's R hole, which is the held out whole chromosome. And, um, and then we, we also um, uh, evaluated each model's ability to predict variant effects. And um, fortunately, there are uh, MPRA experiments that have measured saturation mutagenesis for re uh, 15 regulatory elements. And they're all a part of the CAGI-5 challenge. And so we tested our model's ability to predict these variant effects. And, um, and, and so on, on the x-axis shows the, that performance uh, across all of these 15 regulatory elements. And you can see that it really is no contest here. The quantitative models are really dominating over these old school binary models. And so hopefully this uh, catalyzes a new generation of, of models in, in this space so that we can uh, move forward. Now, there are a lot more other insights, but you know, I'm just glossing over and I'm gonna now cover the main uh, focus of this uh, talk, which is on uh, interpretability methods. So over the, over the years, there have been a lot of progress on model interpretability in genomics. And uh, there are three prominent methods, which are feature attribution methods or interventional in silico experiments. And uh, also, model interpretability, or, or like uh, designing the model such that their parameters are intrinsically interpretable. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna go, go over each one of them. Um, attribution methods map the importance of each nucleotide in a given sequence on model predictions. Oh yeah, that works. On, mo on model predictions. So you can systematically, um, so um, what, what this is, is it, it's essentially a perturbation analysis. You're perturbing the input and seeing how the, mo you're monitoring how the model's prediction changes. And a natural perturbation in genomics is a single nucleotide mutation. 
So we can systematically mutate each nucleotide in a given sequence and map out an in silico mutagenesis map. And we can represent this as a sequence logo like this here at the top. One, may, one issue with in silico mutagenesis is that it's computationally very demanding. Um, so several alternatives have approached, uh, have, have, have emerged over, over the years, um, in, such as saliency maps. So uh, what saliency maps does is it calculates a derivative of the prediction with respect to the input. And what you get out is uh, something very similar to a sensitivity map. Uh, in, instead of making single nucleotide mutations, we're making small little epsilon mutations. But in practice, uh, attribution maps can be very, very noisy. So actually several alternative attribution methods have emerged over the years and they constantly keep on emerging. Everyone and their grandmother has their own attribution method nowadays. Uh, but in the end, they all give very similar results in the end, like this example here. Um, and, and recently attribution methods have really come under fire uh, because in fields like computer vision. And this makes sense because, you know, in computer vision, perturbing an individual pixel doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially when you have a whole bunch of other pixels in the image that are highly correlated. Uh, and also in, in images, uh, the features are very hierarchical. So if a region is highlighted uh, as being important, then you don't actually know whether it's the edges, the textures, or, or the shapes that, that the model thinks is important. Uh, on the other hand, individual pixel perturbation certainly has a meaningful place in genomics. So um, actually um, a very interesting observation was made uh, by Ethan, a high schooler in my lab and Rohit, a, a former postdoc. Now, what they were interested in exploring is how regularization could help improve the efficacy of attribution analysis. So what they did was they trained hundreds of deep learning models with different regularization strategies. The details of that aren't important for this talk, um, and, but they trained a whole bunch of different models but they trained it on synthetic data where we have random DNA sequences with motifs implanted in them. So when we do attribution analysis, we know exactly which positions the, mo the model, uh, the attributions should be at located. And so we can quantify that. Uh, and we call this an interpretability AU rock. Now, what, what you can see here, the striking thing you can see here is that there are so many models. So actually each dot is a different unique model. And the striking thing is that in, you, there are so many models that have high classification performance, but their interpretability performance is all over the place. That means that our current strategy on selecting what the best model is, is fundamentally flawed because what we tend to do as a field right now is we try to pick, select the best model based on held out test performance. But that's all of these models in the red box here. And you can get completely different interpretations from attribution analysis uh, from, from just using the single metric. So um, we really need to rethink model selection for scientific discovery. Now, you might be wondering, how can this scenario arise? Uh, where a model general, generalizes well, but its interpretability is so unreliable. Well, there are several reasons why this can be. The first one is uh, the model itself can have learned poor representations. So in the field of robust machine learning, it's been shown that there are low level statistical properties that are intrinsic to each given data type. And uh, it turns out that a lot of deep learning models rely on these to make predictions. And so actually the field has uh, harnessed this information, exploited this information to generate things like adversarial examples, for instance. Um, but the model can also just learn shortcut representations. These are features that are just uh, are based on spurious correlations. And spurious correlations arise uh, due to a, a, a finite sample size and, and, and a biased data set. But even if the model learns a, a perfect perfect underlying motifs in your data set, it can still learn, it can still give unreliable attribution maps. And it can do so if the model's function that it learns is noisy. So here is an example. Imagine, take for instance, this toy data set here. We have this ideal fit shown in red. Now, if we have a neural network that fits a very noisy function because it got one perfect on the training set, it still generalizes just as well as the ideal fit on held out test data because it stays close to the ideal fit. But what happens is 
when, when we're trying to calculate the derivative of uh, the, an attribution analysis of a given sequence, which lies along this function, you know, in this case, it has a steep positive slope. But imagine if we introduce a, a neutral mutation to the sequence. We're going to move to a nearby point along this function, and the derivative will be completely different. So it's just really unreliable now uh, if our neural networks are learning noisy functions. But guess what? We don't actually have good ways of characterizing this yet. And so we're, we're just gambling right now every time we do interpretability analysis. <clears throat> Now, I'm not going to go into this today, but I did just want to mention uh, that there is a lot of effort in my lab to improve the efficacy of these attribution analysis. Uh, we, we do it through correcting uh, the attribution maps or regularization strategies, and also we re recently got into model selection schemes. Uh, but this will be a topic for another time, or you guys can talk, we can chat about this after. Um, <clears throat> Now, while attribution maps are really helpful in understanding features learned by the deep learning models, they still are, you know, only, the, you know, they're, they're just giving you single nucleotide importance scores. The fact that we can see motifs from these single nucleotide importance maps is, is, is great, but it doesn't tell us a lot more than which nucleotides are important. So these are actual um, attribution maps for uh, actually the deep star uh, model that, uh, that that was presented earlier today. And you know, if you look at this, you're like, well, maybe you know, I do see some patterns that seem to be repeating. I'm not sure. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Um, and and that's a, that's the limitation of attribution analysis. You have to physically look at these things and deduce what you think the model is learning. And when I look at, even if we had a perfect attribution uh, map like this here, uh, there's still several questions that always arise when I look at these maps. Are the variations of the motifs important from sequence to sequence? Is the order or distance between each of these motifs important? Do the motifs interact in an additive or cooperative manner? And how much does the sequence context matter? And in the end, uh, if you stare at these attribution maps long enough, you just start wondering, am I just over-interpreting all of these things? And, and so this is what leads me to uh, this next area, uh, this next section on uh, interventional and silico experiments. Now, even though attribution maps are kind of noisy and you have to deduce, kind of guess what, what it's doing, it's really helpful for that. It's helpful for generating, providing a launch pad to generate hypotheses. Uh, but it can't inform you on any of them. So to quantitatively test hypotheses, uh, we need to move beyond those anecdotal observations. And, and, and the gold standard for, uh, for uh, measuring causal effect sizes is the RCT, the randomized controlled trial. In an RCT, there are two groups, uh, a treatment group and a control group. People in the treatment group are given, are, are given an intervention or drug, and the people in the control group are given a placebo. And uh, then the average effect size is measured within each of those groups. And, and this, uh, this randomization and averaging uh, effectively helps to remove any confounders within any individual. So we have formulated a similar framework to interpret deep neural networks. And we call this global importance analysis. And the, the, the basic idea is we're gonna sample a diverse array of sequences, a background sequences, uh, these are going to be our individuals. And then our intervention is to give them an implant, a pattern, like a motif. And uh, we're going to implant them in the same position across all of the different sequences. And then we're going to average over them. And what this averaging does is it, effect, it effectively marginalizes over all of those other confounders within any individual sequence. So what GIA does is it measures the effect size of just the, the controlled pattern that we embedded. While, uh, while controlling for everything else. So um, here's an example of, of how GEO has been helpful. Uh, here, um, I have a residual by model that was trained on RNA compete data. This is data that measures RNA the sequence, specific, uh, the sequence specificity of RNAs to RNA binding proteins. Uh, and this RNA compete data set assay was created uh, here at University of Toronto by the Hughes Lab. And um, basically, the idea is that it's just like a microarray, but for RNA protein interactions. Now, uh, 
I'm just going to look at one specific protein, uh, RBP, RNA binding protein that they studied, VTS1, which binds to this motif, and it's known to bind in the, uh, in the context of a hairpin loop. Now, um, you know, we trained our, our fancy neural network model, and the predictions were fantastic. You can do attribution analysis, and it was meaning, meaningless. Uh, and so, uh, but we did see this VTS1 motif, and we wanted to know, uh, we asked the question, is it learning the dependencies like the high, you know, like um, the, the hairpin, uh, you know, the, the dependency that it has a preference for a hairpin loop? So we performed a G experiment where we embedded that VTS1 motif in random RNA sequences uh, in different locations, and also RNA sequences uh, that were designed with a hairpin loop. And you can see here that our, the model's prediction when the motif is inside the loop, it jumps up quite significantly. And recently, um, the Stark lab has also used GIA to interpret their neural network model called Deep Star. And uh, this was, again, uh, uh, the, this StarSeq data that measures enhancer activity in an NPRA-like reporter assay. Uh, and basically, they asked several interesting questions about uh, higher order dependencies of motif flanks or even motif cooperativity and their distance dependence. Uh, and they even validated a lot of their, their, um, their GIA predictions. And, and so together, this shows you that, you know, that really the speculations that we get of what we think the network is learning from these, those attribution analysis, we can be doing um, actual experiments in silico to, to show that the model's actually doing that. Now, just to give you a little bit more insight into how my lab thinks of, uh, of, of modeling regulatory genomics, here is a, a schematic. Uh, this is sequence function space where the elevation represents the activity, some functional activity. Uh, and the observed data is shown in white and it's sparsely located in the space. And after we train our neural network, our neural network based on the sparsity, the sparse you know, um, data points is trying to infer the sequence function landscape. And because of benign overfitting, it's probably a much more rugged surface than this. Now, when employing interpretability methods, we're asking specific questions. For instance, those attribution maps, the, uh, the saliency maps, uh, for a given sequence, you're located on that in the space. You're asking, what is the slope at that location? Uh, in silico mutagenesis, you're asking, uh, you know, you're sampling a slightly larger window around that sequence function space because you're making single nucleotide mutations, but you're effectively still asking slope information. What global importance analysis is doing is it's averaging the local topology across wide regions in this sequence function landscape. And recently, Evan Seitz, who is a joint postdoc with uh, me and uh, Justin Kinney, has started asking another question. Um, he started asking, um, you know, can we uh, characterize uh, the, the larger neighborhoods in this sequence function landscape beyond just simple slopes? but with nonlinear biophysical models that we can fully interpret. And um, unfortunately, I don't have time to get into this. I'll, you know, it is early stages in this project, but we're, 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 we figured out that this actually works and we're, we're gonna try to wrap up a, a paper soon. So hopefully sometime early next year. Okay, um, but I'll be happy to chat about that if you're interested also afterwards. Uh, okay, now, Another major goal of my lab is to design neural networks such that their parameters are intrinsically interpretable. And the common motivation for neural network designs is to build representations like these here, where so, uh, the first layer learns uh, something like motifs, and then the second layer learns uh, neighboring motif interactions, and then deeper layers learn regulatory uh, codes over larger sequence context. Now, a problem with this is that um, each layer doesn't necessarily learn these features, at, at least this cleanly. And the second problem is that accessing these motif interactions in these deeper layers still remains a challenge uh, to this day. Now, ideally, I think what we really would want is an architecture that learns motifs really well in the first layer and then learns motif interactions in a second layer instead of having to rely on what, like 24 layers or something uh, where it, it's really complex. <clears throat> and this is possible with convolutional attention networks. And in a convolutional attention network, 
uh, the first uh, convolutional layer can learn a motif. And then uh, the so-called multi-head self-attention layer can learn motif interactions. And uh, so multi-head self-attention is the primary component of a transformer, which has driven state-of-the-art performance in natural language processing, computer vision, and even protein structure prediction. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just give you uh, a little bit more of like a, a quick crash course on what multi-head attention is. So multi-head self-attention is given by this equation here, where Q, K, and B are just uh, some represent queries, keys, and values. So I'll explain what that means in a second, just at a high level. So our, our neural network, uh, after the first convolutional layer, this basically uh, changes our one-hot encoding into a convolutional scan encoding, where each position now represents a convolutional uh, scan value, uh, a, value a, a vector of values of different convolutional filters. So it tells you which motifs are in uh, are at that position there. Okay, now that is input to the multi-head self-attention layer. And in this multi-head self-attention layer, we take one position and embed it into a query into a query space, and that's with this query matrix. So this is just some linear projection space. And then we systematically embed all of the other positions into another uh, representation, uh, another linear um, uh, projection space, key space. And then we just look at the similarities of each of those together. And then uh, we calculate, uh, we scale it and calculate the softmax over the key dimension. And then, uh, and then you do this systematically for different queries. And this maps out a uh, position by position interaction matrix. So, uh, and, and then afterwards, uh, you, we use a value uh, matrix to, to project that back down to a dimension that we want, usually the same size as the input. Now, I know if this is your first time seeing this, this is quite daunting, right? Uh, there, there's a lot going on here and I, and I didn't show you, like I just went over quickly with high, high details. And so I, I wouldn't expect you to really have a full good grasp of it, but really the intuition that you really should uh, take away from this is that it's fundamentally capturing pairwise statistics. Now, uh, but unlike physics-based models that learn pairwise interactions like Markov random fields or icing models or POTS models, uh, those learn a single global interaction matrix. What multi-head self-attention is doing is it's learning, it has multiple attention heads. So it, it has many variations of, of position, position interaction matrix. Uh, it has um, position interactions. It has multiple variations of position interactions. And uh, also we're, we're not using the vectors directly for those interactions. We're projecting them onto some uh, key or query space. And that adds to ex expressivity. So multi-head self-attention is basically uh, capturing pairwise statistics, but in a more flexible manner. So uh, <clears throat> now to actually, you know, that architecture, that was just an argument. Who knows whether they're actually learning this stuff that, that we're hoping that they learn, right? But in order to extract the motif interactions uh, from that convolutional attention matrix, we need to be able to satisfy three challenges. The first challenge is that the first layer must actually learn motifs in the first place. Uh, and this has been addressed by several papers by my lab over the years. So uh, making co first convolutional layer filters actually learn mo strong motif representations is, is something that, uh, that, that, that can be done. Now, the second challenge is given that attention uh, matrix, we need to be able to identify which position pairs are actually active or being attended to. And um, what we do here is we just plot a histogram of the attention values and we just set some arbitrary threshold. And it turns out that this is good enough, uh, okay? And the third challenge is each attention uh, element that, that in the attention matrix is, is pointing to two positions, but those two positions are vectors of, of convolutional filter scans. We don't know which of those, which motif, which filters are actually active, and those are the interacting ones. They only point us to those two positions. So what we do here is we concatenate those two positions uh, for each attended uh, attended pair of positions, and then we calculate the correlation of the filters. Uh, uh, do a cross correlation 
uh, of the of the different filters, and this maps out the filter by filter correlation matrix. So this is uncovering a global filter correlations that for positions that we're attending to. Okay. Now we we apply this convolutional attention uh, network to a, a, a handful of data sets. Here I'm just going to show it to you for the the StarSeq data from the Deep Star paper. Uh, fortunately, that was talked about a lot today, so I don't really need to describe it. Uh, here is the 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 the, the correlate the filter by filter correlation matrix, and I've labeled which uh, filters uh, uh, which motifs each of those filters correspond to. And um, actually, uh, you know, one interesting thing about this Deep Star paper uh, that, that everyone talks about um, th th today is that they, th their, their focus of their paper really focus on this GATA and EP1 interactions, which is light, uh, light blue right here. And you can see that our model seems to have captured a, a whole lot more interactions uh, beyond just those, just beyond just that AP1 GATA interaction. But you're probably wondering, is this real or is this just, you know, it's just some random rando correlation matrix? Well, we can we can validate this uh, motif interaction matrix, whether it's an artifact or real, by performing a GEO experiment. And in our GEO experiment, we can take two candidate motifs and embed them on the same sequence together and perform a GEO experiment. Or we can take each of those uh, motifs and embed them in independently. And, and just compare the additive effects versus the combined effects. And that gives us a cooperativity effect size. And um, here on the left is our model, our convolutional attention model, uh, th this cooperative effect experiment. And on the right is the original deep star model. Okay. And, and, uh, and you can see that our model and the deep star model largely learn the same motif interactions. Uh, and, and some of them are, are like really, really much, much greater than the GATA AP1 interaction, which was the central focus of their paper. And just as a control, we also looked at those other white and red regions, and we largely found that, hey, we actually don't see any cooperative uh, interactions uh, too. So this was a nice control for us. And another interesting region was right here where we see uh, some kind of uh, strand specific directional uh, motif interactions. Uh, it's kind of faint, uh, even on the interaction matrix, it's, it's, it's a little thin, but you have GATA and GATA reverse complement here, and it's interacting with GA, runs of GA or runs of CT, and they're not crossing each other. So it's really like uh, GATA interacts with GA and GATA reverse complement interacts with CT and GA and CT are reverse complements of each other, right? And so, um, and, and, and the crosses are all red. And we can perform a G experiment where we see exactly that, where the, the crosses are at zero. And, you know, it's, so, so it really learns some strand specificity here. The effect size is small here, but it's also small in our global interaction matrix. Now, okay, so I, I'm almost done. I'll just, uh, I just have uh, one, one last uh, um, thing that I wanna talk about. Um, this I think is is really cool, uh, and and uh, so I, I think it's just uh, yeah we'll we'll talk about it. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so we all know that neural networks require a lot of data. They're data hungry. They need a lot of data to train their models, and also uh, in practice we perform tons of data augmentations in order to train these models to become like much more robust, and. Um, and, and so what are data augmentations? Data augmentations basically provide a, you know, a prior for your neural networks function so that it becomes uh, you know, uh, invariant to the symmetries of the data augmentation. So here's an example of that com complicated sentence. Uh, suppose we have a cat, we can rotate it or magnify it or translate it. And if you train your model on all of these and you still say that each of them are, are cats, then your model will learn that, oh, uh, whether I'm rotated or not, it should, it's still a cat. So we're, we're guiding the model to be rotationally invariant and translationally invariant and, magnific and invariant to magnifications. But there aren't that many uh, augmentation strategies for genomics. And uh, right now we only have reverse complementing the sequence 
And uh, sometimes this is rarely used, but I think it's uh, very powerful is random translations, just shifting the sequence around just a little bit. It, it seems so simple, but uh, it's, it, yeah, but it, the problem is, is our data sets are, are fundamentally limited by the underlying biology for measuring transcription factor binding, for instance, it might only bind to a high affinity sites in accessible regions. And so there's a fundamental limit on how much data you can acquire. And so, you know, we have that small data problem and the limited augmentation strategies, which really limits our ability to, to train robust models. So um, <clears throat> to address this, we came up with a new set of data augmentation strategies inspired by evolution. This is going to sound crazy, but uh, just bear with me. Uh, we can like randomly mutate it or take, do random deletions or insertions or random translocations where you take two segments and swap them or random inversions. Now, the, your, your, you know, evolution does this to enhance genetic diversity and to enhance function so that you can uh, select on them. We don't know what these mutations and uh, perturbations are gonna actually do to the function of the sequence. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look the other way and just say it's the same function as wild type and, and train the model anyway. Now, uh, each of those, what, what that does is it imposes a specific prior. Imagine if you do insertions or deletions and you have two motifs, you're saying that the spacing between motifs might not matter. Or if you do translocation, you're saying the ordering of the motifs doesn't matter. Or if you do an inversion, maybe the motif orientation doesn't matter. And those are priors that you're now encoding into your models. And this does not reflect biology, right? It, could, it may not, right? These are symmetries that we've invented. So we use these augmentations as just a pre-trained strategy. And then what we do is we then we fine tune the model on the actual data uh, without any perturbations, without any augmentations. So we think that the augmentations are gonna be really helpful to learn robust features, but the function that it learns might be slightly wrong, uh, right? And then we're gonna fine tune it so that we're guiding the model's function back to biological reality. Now, here is an example of uh, the original Bassett model uh, trained on uh, chromatin accessibility data. So this is just a simple CNN model, one of the original uh, deep learning models in geno regulatory genomics in, this, uh, in, in the era of deep learning. And it's trained on to predict 161 chromatin uh, DNA uh, seq uh, data sets. So very large scale model. And uh, here is the original model's performance. Uh, based on the classification AUPR, or under the precision recall curve. And now we're doing each augmentation independently. And you see the model's prediction jumps up quite dramatically. And then we start doing combinations of, of, of these together on a sequence. So really tag teaming uh, the mutations and really like bringing it far away from the natural distribution. And you, you see that, oh, uh, I should have also mentioned that in blue is the augmented model. Uh, just the pre-trained model and orange is the fine-tuned model and in each case the fine-tuning helps uh further uh helps the performance out further and and here's another example for the deep star model this is the original deep star uh model trained on the original deep star data set you have this the performance of of the original model right here and then you have uh all all of the augmentation strategies and in combination and you see that there are added benefits to doing this Okay, so this will be a bar archive any day now. We're just wrapping up the package, uh, doing last minute checks and balances on the package, but the paper is fully written and it'll probably be posted sometime this week. Okay, so, uh, you know, had the, the, the computer not malfunctioned, uh, the presentation not malfunctioned, I would have wanted to mention some brief uh, ch open challenges in deep learning uh, in, in this space. Uh, you know, but I'll, instead of going over them and having a, you know, detailed discussion, I'll just highlight um, the main takeaways here. Uh, DNNs are often used as oracles, predictors, that we can predict any sequence now that we have this trained model, but they are not oracles, or they're not good oracles. They're only good at in-distribution predictions, and uh, our models are trained on natural genomic variation. They don't, like if you gave it a cancer genome with like all kinds of messed up things, they, they will be terrible at that prediction. Uh, but we don't know how far, when is a sequence too far out of the distribution that the model is reliable for. The model doesn't know it and we don't know it. So that's a big issue. 
uh, we need better ways to evaluate our models. And um, a lot of times, like even what I did, I'm guilty of this today, is that we just show that our models learn motifs that were already known that other simpler models could have already done too. So what is the competitive advantage of our neural network models? Is it learning something better, more biology? It, you know, it, we need to get like, go beyond just showing uh, the, the basic things. And, and three is, uh, uncertainty, we need ways to quantify uncertainty in our models predictions and, and also uh, uncertainty in our model interpretability. Uh, we need to know when we can trust our models explanations. And with that, uh, you know, um, I think uh, everyone in the lab uh, throughout the presentation. So uh, here's my lab for hiring postdocs. Thank you.